You are listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. From the pilgrims who came here nearly three and one half centuries ago until this very day, people have sacrificed. They have contributed. They have built themselves into the fight of being of America. It is from them that we receive this land as legacy. torch of flame. Let us hold it high and light up the sun with praise of our gallant men. Tyrants must know. Now, just as then, they cannot stand. Not as long as there are young men. Throughout the history of this country, it has been an honored profession. The service of one's country by enlisting or becoming an officer in one of the branches of our military forces. One man in our history who made the military service his very life the substance of his soul, the service to his country, was General Douglas MacArthur. He is a man who was loved by many, many people in this country, and he is remembered to this day. He was a man who was caught between the coming of a new age and what he had been taught that was the old age. He was a man who was to lead troops into the battle of really the last great war that was really fought for a purpose. A purpose that everyone in the world knew and recognized and understood. Harry Truman had signed the United Nations Treaty and the Senate had ratified it. He had also 
signed and passed into law the United Nations Participation Act. And it was those two acts, really, which sealed the fate of General Douglas MacArthur. For you see, by that act, we were relegated to fighting small wars for reasons other than the, what the public would ever understand. Wars designed to bring about a new world order, a world ruled by a United Nations in a world propelled toward the destruction of sovereignty of nations. General MacArthur did not understand that at the time, and indeed, many of us who live today don't understand it. He didn't know how to fight a holding action. He didn't know how to stop at an arbitrary line when the enemy was routed in defeat. He didn't know how to lose a war on purpose. And for that reason, he was fired. I think eventually he came to understand it, however, and I think that you will be able to hear that in this speech. The speech that he delivered before the Corps of Cadets of the United States Military Academy at West Point on May 12, 1962, his alma mater. You see, General Douglas MacArthur was a member of the Long Gray Line. He was there to accept the Sylvanus Thayer Award for service to his nation. The general spoke without a prepared address, without even notes. And yet this moving address commits to words as never before the creed of the Long Gray Line. Indeed, it does much more than that. It honors with eloquence the American soldier, his courage, his sacrifice, and his deeds. General Westmoreland, General Groves, distinguished guests, gentlemen of the Corps, as I was leaving the hotel this morning, a doorman asked me, where are you bound for, General? And when I replied West Point, he remarked, beautiful place. Have you ever been there before? <laughs> No human being could fail to be deeply moved by such a tribute as this. Coming from a profession I have served so long and a people I have loved so well, it fills me with an emotion I cannot express. But this award is not intended primarily to honor a personality, but to symbolize a great moral code. The code of conduct and chivalry of those who guard this beloved land of culture and ancient descent. That is the animation of this medallion. For all eyes and for all time, it is an expression of the ethics of the American soldier. And I should be integrated in this way with so noble an ideal 
arouses a sense of pride and yet of humility which will be with me always. Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. They are your rallying points to build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. Unhappily, I possess neither that eloquence of diction, that poetry of imagination, nor that brilliance of metaphor to tell you all that they mean. The young believer will say they are but words, but a slogan, but a flamboyant phrase. Every pedant, every demigod, every cynic, every hypocrite, every troublemaker, and I am sorry to say, some others of an entirely different character will try to downgrade them even to the extent of mockery and ridicule. But these are some of the things they do. They build your basic character. They mold you for your future roles as the custodians of the nation's defense. They make you strong enough to know when you are weak and brave enough to face yourself when you are a friend. They teach you to be proud and unbending in honest failure, but humble and gentle in success. Not to substitute words for actions, not to seek the path of comfort but to face the stress and spur of difficulty and challenge. To learn to stand up in the storm, but to have compassion on those who fall. To master yourself before you seek to master others. To have a heart that is clean, a goal in his heart to learn to laugh, but yet never forget how to weep. To reach into the future, yet never neglect the past. To be serious, yet never to take yourself too seriously. To be modest, so that you will remember the simplicity of true greatness 
the open mind of true wisdom, the meekness of true strength. They give you a temper of the will, a quality of the imagination, a vigor of the emotions, a freshness of the deep springs of life. A temperamental predominance of courage over timidity, of an appetite for adventure over love of ease. They create in your heart the sense of wonder, the unfailing hope of what next and the joy and inspiration of life. They teach you in this way to be an officer and a gentleman. And what sort of soldiers are those you are to lead? Are they reliable? Are they brave? Are they capable of victory? Their story is known to all of you. It is the story of the American man at arms. My estimate of him was formed on the battlefield many, many years ago and has never changed. I regarded him then as I regard him now as one of the world's noblest figures, not only as one of the finest military characters, but also as one of the most stainless. His name and fame are the birthright of every American citizen. In his youth and strength, his love and loyalty, he gave all that mortality can give. He needs no eulogy from me or from any other man. He has written his own history and written it in red on his eminent breast. But when I think of his patience under adversity, of his courage under fire, and of his modesty and victory, I am filled with an emotion of admiration I cannot put into words. He belongs to history as furnishing one of the greatest examples of successful patriotism. He belongs to posterity as the instructor of future generations in the principles of liberty and freedom. He belongs to the present, to us, by his virtues and by his achievements. In 20 campaigns, on a hundred battlefields, Around a thousand campfires, I have witnessed that enduring fortitude, that patriotic 
self-abnegation and that invincible determination which have caused his statue in the heart of its people. From one end of the world to the other, he has drained deep the chalice of courage. As I listen to those songs, in memory's eye, I could see those staggering columns of the First World War, bending under soggy packs on many a weary march. From dripping dust to drizzling dawn, slogging ankle deep through the mire of shell shock roads to form grimly for the attack, blue it, covered with sludge and mud, chilled by the wind and rain driving home to their objective, and for many, to the judgment seat of God. I do not know the dignity of their birth, but I do know the glory of their death. They died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in their hearts and on their lips, the hope that we would go on to victory. Always for them, duty, honor, country. Always their blood and sweat and tears as we saw the way and the light and the truth. And twenty years after, on the other side of the globe, again, the filth of murky foxholes, the stench of ghostly trenches, the slime of dripping dugouts, those broiling suns of relentless heat, those torrential rains of devastating storm, the loneliness and utter desolation of jungle trails, the bitterness of long separation from those they loved and cherished. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Don't go away, folks. We're going to take a short break. We will be right back. This is the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. We continue now with General Douglas MacArthur's acceptance speech for the Sylvanus Thayer Award at the United States Military Academy at West Point. A long separation from those they loved and cherished. The deadly pestilence of tropical disease. The horror of stricken areas of war, their resolute and determined defense, their swift and sure attack, their indomitable purpose, their complete and decisive victory, always victory, always through the 
bloody haze of their last reverberating shock. The vision of God, ghastly men, reverently following your password of duty, honor, country. The code which those words perpetuate embraces the highest moral law and will stand the test of any ethics or philosophies ever promulgated for the uplift of mankind. Its requirements are for the things that are right. And its restraints are from the things that are wrong. The soldier, above all other men, is required to practice the greatest act of religious training, sacrifice, in battle and in the face of danger and death. He discloses those divine attributes which his maker gave when he created man in his own image. No physical courage and no brute instinct can take the place of the divine health which alone can sustain him. However hard the incidents of war may be, the soldier who is called upon to offer and to give his life for his country is the noblest development of mankind. You now face a new world, a world of change, the thrust into outer space of the satellite spheres and missiles mark the beginning of another epoch in the long story of mankind. In the five or more billions of years, the scientists tell us it has taken to form the Earth. In the three or more billion years of development of the human race, there has never been a more abrupt or staggering evolution. We deal now not with things of this world alone, but with the illimitable distances and as yet unfathomed mysteries of the universe, we are reaching out for a new and boundless frontier. We speak in strange terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of making winds and tides work for us, of creating unheard synthetic materials to supplement or even replace our old standard basics, to purify sea water for our drinks, of mining ocean floors for new fields of wealth and food, of disease preventatives to expand life into a hundred of years, of controlling the weather, 
for a more equitable distribution of heat and cold, of rain and shine, of spaceships to the moon, of the primary target in war, no longer limited to the armed forces of an enemy, but instead to include his civil population of ultimate conflict between the united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy of such dreams and fantasies as to make life the most exciting of all time. And through all this welfare of change and development, your mission remains fixed, determined, inviolable. It is to win our war. Everything else in your professional career is but corollary to this vital dedication. All of the public purposes, all of the public projects, all of the public needs, great or small, will find others for their accomplishment. But you are the ones who are trained to fight. Yours is the profession of arms, the will to win, the sure knowledge that in war there is no substitute for victory, that if you lose, the nation will be destroyed, that the very obsession of your public service must be duty, honor, country. Others will debate the controversial issues, national and international, which divide men's minds. But serene, calm, aloof, you stand as the nation's war guardian, as its lifeguard from the raging tides of international conflict, as its gladiator in the arena of battle. For a century and a half, you have defended, guarded, and protected its hallowed traditions of liberty and freedom, of right and justice. Let civilian voices argue the merits or demerits of our processes of government. Whether our strength is being sapped by deficit financing indulged in too long, by federal paternalism grown too mighty, by power groups grown too arrogant, by politics grown too corrupt, by crime grown too rampant, by morals grown too low, by taxes grown too high, by extremists grown too violent, whether our personal liberties are as thorough and complete as they should be, these great national problems are not for your professional participation or military solution. Your guidepost stands out like a tenfold beacon in the night. Duty, honor, country. You are the lever 
which binds together the entire fabric of our national system of defense. From your ranks come the great captains who hold the nations justly in their hands the moment the war toxin sounds. The long gray line has never failed us. Were you to do so, a million ghosts in olive drab, in brown cocky, in blue and gray, would rise from their white crosses, thundering those magic words, duty, honor, country. This does not mean that you are war mongers. On the contrary, the soldier, above all of the people, prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. But always in our ears, Bring the ominous words of Plato, that wisest of all philosophers. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Shadows are lengthening for me. The twilight is here. My days of old have vanished. Tone and tint. They have gone glimmering through the dreams of things that were. Their memory is one of wondrous beauty, watered by tears and coaxed and caressed by the smiles of yesterday. I listen vainly, but with thirsty ear. For the wishing melody, a faint bugle blowing reverie, a far drum beating the long road. In my dreams, I hear again the crash of guns, the rattle of musketry. The strange, mournful mutter of the battlefield. But in the evening of my memory, always I come back to West Point. Always there echoes and re-echo duty, honor, country. Today marks my final roll call with you. But I want you to know that when I cross the river, my last Conscious thoughts will be of the core and the core and the core. I bid you farewell.
You're listening to the Hour of the Time, the only hour that ever was or ever will be or that ever is. This is the hour during which you will decide your future and thus our collective futures. If you are taping this, send a copy to Ollie North and Admiral Poindexter and write in big letters, duty, honor, country. What has happened that men who are sworn to protect and defend the Constitution are spending so much of their time subverting it? Men who are signed and sworn to the service of their country spend so much time breaking the law, going against the edicts of the Congress and thus of the people who elected them. How can a man be sworn to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, blatantly shred it and relegate it to the trash can? What has happened to the long gray line? Let me ask you this. Why did Truman sign the UN Participation Act and pass it into law? Why was the United Nations Treaty passed? What is the real purpose of the disarmament agency if not to bring about a new world order? A one world government. And if its purpose is to bring that about, ask yourself, and then ask yourself again, and then again, and then again, how could it possibly be? How could they do this? How in the world could they bring it about without the destruction of the sovereignty of the United States of America and thus the destruction of the Constitution? Without the full knowledge, consent, complicity, and cooperation of the officer corps of all four of the military services. Ask yourself, and then ask yourself again, and then again, and then again. And how could the officer corps justify going against their oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now that is what you call a paradox. But I am telling you that it has been done and it has been justified and the New World Order is manifesting before your very eyes at this very moment. It doesn't take a genius to be able to read between the lines of the newspapers and to be able to hear what's really being said on the news to understand that the old world is disappearing and a new one is being born. And if Americans don't wake up in time, they will find that everything that they have cherished and loved and everything that men like General Douglas MacArthur fought for will pass by the wayside and will be no more. Those of you who believe that you will establish a utopia on this earth are dreamers, and your dreams will never be realized. For to believe in that utopia is to deny the very basic nature of mankind. And all throughout the history of the world, what has emerged always above everything else is the flawed basic nature of mankind. The only way that you could ever bring your utopia into existence is if you had a leader who was a true saint. who came from a point of perfect benevolence 
and who is able to have absolute and total control over every other human being on this planet during every single moment of every 24-hour period. I say you will never find such a leader, and you will never find a populace which would allow such total and complete control over their very thoughts and actions during every moment of every day. I say that you do not have at all an understanding of the great disparity between your dreams and your abilities. And I say there will be no such utopia. Douglas MacArthur said, quote, Only the dead have seen the end of war. Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, good night, and God bless you all.